Coming up on Theater Talk. And the other night I saw somebody on television on one of these horrible, um, you know, talent shows. <laughs> the, the judges said you weren't very good, and the person said, I felt great. And I thought, what well, doesn't matter what you feel? <laughs> it only matters what the audience feels. Theater Talk is made possible in part by the CUNY TV Foundation. From New York City, this is Theater Talk. I'm the show's producer, Susan Haskin. And I'm Michael Riedel of the New York Post. So, Michael, it is the year of Terrence Rattigan. Yes, uh, Terrence Rattigan is one of our favorite playwrights. Uh, he wrote Separate Tables, the Browning version. And you're very lucky now if you're in New York because there is a production, a very fine production, of a rare Terrence Rattigan play called Man and Boy. And I got to say, one of the reasons, maybe the reason, that it is so spectacular is because of its star. He's a dear friend of ours here at Theater Talk, one of the great actors, I think maybe the great stage actor of our time, Frank Langella. Thanks, Michael. Welcome back Welcome. to Theater Talk. Hi, Susan. Thank you. Now, I know that you're a fan of Rattigan, too, and yeah. this play has kind of divided the critics. Some people like it. Some people don't. Can you tell us a little bit about the play and sort of make the case for it? Well, the thing about the play I love more than anything else is the father-son story, even though it's sort of sold as a, as a um, Wall Street story. It's, mm -hmm. it's, I think, a universal story about uh, missed love, you know, about a son very much needing a very strong father figure to see him and notice him, mm -hmm. and a father unable to feel, or actually having made himself not feel and not love in order to live the life he lives. And I think that notion and idea that everybody has about um, preventing themselves from loving because it gets in the way of something s safe for them and selfish for them is very powerful in human beings. And that's what I find most exciting about that. And we should say that you play a, um, a Wall Street financier, which reminds everybody of Bernie Madoff. Because yeah. at this point, his and entire... And we look so much alike, don't we? <laughs> 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 because when the play begins, his entire empire, which is a fraud, is about to collapse, yeah. and he goes out to hide out in his estranged son's Greenwich Village apartment. Mm. And when you say this kind of soulless relationship, is it because this man, to achieve the success he's done, to perpetrate this massive fraud, had to kind of dehumanize himself, divest himself of real relationships? Yes, he says in the play at a certain point, um, to be loved and worshipped by a grown boy, and this boy above all is something I, I can't do. Uh, love is a commodity I can't afford. And back to what I said earlier, I think more people suffer from this than we'd like to know, mm. who turn away, from lo turn away from the thing they very much want. Most of the people I know in our profession who are tough and mean and difficult and seem to be invulnerable and even rude are the people I know want love more than anybody else, and their defenses against it are so strong, and so, you know, they just push you away, mm. and the more they push you away, the more I always sense they want someone to come up and hug them, and nobody does because they're all afraid of them and think, oh, I guess they don't want it. Yeah, who is ever going to hug David Merrick? Right, and that's, <laughs> right, exactly, and that's, um, that's possibly why the play means so much to me is I, I sort of identify with that problem in human beings. Mm. Uh, when you say identify with that problem, when you were building your career, going to the top, was that something that as a young actor, a, a movie star, one has to do? Um, well, I, I was an immensely vulnerable kid, you know, really. I cried at the drop of a hat. I wanted love as much as the boy in this play does from my parents and from just about anybody, which is why most people become actors. Mm -hmm. You don't become actors for the love of the craft. You become it for the, the need to be loved. And then eventually, if you're lucky, you b begin to understand what a respectable and noble profession it is, and you fall in love with that part. But in the beginning, you really just want to be loved. So there are elements of both the father and the son in me. When you are a young actor, when you're, when you're, when you're so ambitious, oh, yeah. do you then have to kind of well, you ha I had to do a, a very important thing for me, which is it, with each decade, 
I had to I had to put on a stronger suit of armor to endure the toughness of this profession and how vulnerable I was to it. And when I was about 28, I remember a designer in a costume room saying to me when I was going on and on about some herd, he said, you have to train yourself to never let people know what you're thinking in this profession or you'll just be eaten alive. <laughs> and it was very difficult for me because I was vociferous and open and very much wrong. And also I was arrogant and very opinionated. So. Mm. I was a mass of all those contradictions. Your description of yourself, though, it does remind me of this character that you are playing so much in the play, that you, in order to does, do what he has to do, he puts on this suit of armor and lies well, to his, everyone. His suit of armor has been on for decades and decades and decades. It took me a lifetime to get mine in place. And oddly enough, What's beginning to happen to me now is that I'm shedding this suit of armor. The older I get, the less I need it. But success has a lot to do with that. You feel safer and you feel more secure. But even in life, personally, I'm less interested in defending myself against other people. I'm more interested in allowing myself to be heard again, to care again, to all those things. Because as you get closer to the end, you think, why should I carry this suit of armor with me? I really would rather have the hurt and survive it. Got the you energy. You're alive. Susan, you would like to speak. I <laughs> wanted to know if you had been in the position of the son with your father. Yes, but not, not to the degree, no. Yeah. But my father was an enormously successful businessman and somewhat remote, mm. but not as, not as bad as Gregor, no. But yes, I, I think, you know, there are very few sons who will tell you that their fathers were totally loving, totally supportive, and totally always there for them. And those sons are usually very, very solid and healthy men. What did your parents make of your decision to go into the theater to be an actor? Father, totally supportive because I think he wanted me to move away from a possessive mother. And mother scared and, you know, upset about it. But then the moment she saw me on the stage, she understood that was what I had to do. And they lived long enough to see your yes. success? Yeah, they lived when I, when, uh, they died when I was in my 50s. So. Oh, well, then how wonderful they got to see yeah, you. Yeah. Frank, when you came into the green room, you asked me when I had seen Man and Boy, and I saw it during the press preview period, yeah. and you said, oh, it's very different now. And yeah. So then, then this makes me wonder, are you changing your interpretation during the run of the play? Yeah. I'm actually changing it during the performances. During the, the performance. I don't mean that facetiously. If you saw the play, I'm very grateful for the reception I've received. But had anybody seen it in the first two weeks of previews, they would not have been so complimentary. I had no idea where to go. I was very much at sea and trying very hard to figure out, should he have an accent, should he not have an accent? How tough should he be? How sentimental? All the levels of the play are very difficult. So I always, if I can, if I can do it, and with Roundabout I can, I ask for a long preview period because acting is a movable feast. It is something that constantly changes, lives, and breathes. So every night when you come out on stage, you're not trying to repeat what you did the night before. You're trying to find it brand new. And as the, as the preview period went on, and then even after opening, I began to find things in the character and in the relationships of the other actors. I thought, oh, why didn't I think of that? Why didn't this occur to me? He could be more this way. He could be less humorous in certain areas, much darker. And the one thing that's interesting is the darker I make him, the more the audience seems to like him. <laughs> that's the part that's so funny. I mean, he is sort of a, he is kind of Richard III. I mean, a Shakespearean villain, you know, he kind of, it's a wonderfully old-fashioned, and I mean that in the best sense, constructed play, yeah. in that he essentially says to the audience, as Richard III does, this is what I'm going to do, yeah. and watch me do it. Yeah. I think the play, actually, um, its detractors seem to, uh, what's the word I want, kind of pass it off as, as um, second-rate Radigan. Mm -hmm. It is not as great as his greatest plays, but it's as good as any play um, I can think it's as imperfectly wonderful as any play I've ever been in, mm. and it affords extraordinary opportunities to to act and to interchange with other actors, mm. and it's beautifully written. You know these marvelous flights 
that Radigan takes you on. To say his language is very exciting to me. When I saw you uh, after the show the other night, you said one of you lo the thing you loved about the play in Radigan was, I think you described it as crunchy dialogue. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's, ah, the great it's, speeches. That it's meaty and it's witty and there's lots of uh, inverted syntax. You really have to be on your toes to say it. It just isn't, and then I went to the corner. It's very complicated, and it also forces you to um, examine the very worst in yourself. Yeah. You just have to, and I, I've played a number of parts like that, and I always feel rewarded by them. You're known for those roles. Do you, you seek them out, or as you say? <laughs> the the you evil ones it, just come right You're through. moving this <laughs> character do. more that way? Um, well, he's about as evil as anyone yeah, I've yeah. ever played. Yeah. I didn't, Dracula, for instance, I didn't play him as evil at all. I just played him as a very noble man who just happened to need a glass of blood. And you did, <laughs> you, 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 did, you did do Richard Dixon, which some people would argue was... They would argue he was too sympathetic, in mm -hmm. fact. And mm -hmm. uh, Man for All Seasons was a, a good man. But this is, uh, this is, well, I think I've said this before. Whatever part you play, he's your guy, and you have to be on his side. Yeah. And I'm totally on his side. My feeling is he just killed love in himself. He loves this boy. Radigan says the play is about how much a boy loves a man at the first part of the play, how much the man loves the boy in the second part of the play, and how the, the man decides to kill that love in order for the boy to grow mm. as the end of the play. Mm. Mm. And, you know, the play is sold as something about Wall Street, and it is, but... Yeah, it's the Bernie Madoff yeah, connection that they keep making. That human interaction is true and uh, reson resonates in every one of us. You said something I want to go back to when you were struggling in the preview period about using the accent or not, because he's from... Eastern Europe, yeah. it's kind of vague where he might be from. As an actor, how do you work out the accent? Why would you have not used an accent? What finally made you decide, I'm gonna go with this? this well, it's a great question. Um, Mariah and I, Mariah Aiken, our director, and I had real back and forth about this. I instinctively did not want to do an accent and then tried very hard. Um, to find one and went through many rehearsals with all sorts of noises that were horrible. <laughs> and in the end, what I said to Mariah, and uh, she gave up on me finally, <laughs> was I really would rather vote in the direction of truth in my work rather than impress anybody with um, you know, how well I learned an East European accent. Mm. Uh, it's also somewhat a difference between how the British think and how the Americans think. Mariah was very concerned that it should that I was going to get very criticized for not sounding Middle European, and I said, "How many people in that audience are going to know?" It never <laughs> crossed my mind. Right. Well, my my feeling was always, if I don't feel honest and true speaking it, then the audience won't believe me. Mm -hmm. So uh, what happened was I eventually came and didn't even have it when you saw it. I eventually came to a sound that I felt was sort of a cultured maybe raised him, maybe something he learned in English school sound. Just a, a sound that was different than my own. Not the heavy accent. I just thought it would be wrong. We see so many plays that are destroyed by the accent that you see that the actor is focusing on, on the, the accent, accent. and has yeah. lo lost sight yeah. of the character. Yeah. Well, the whole trick in acting is to never be caught doing it. You know, it really is. Yeah. Some of my detractors will tell you that I um, <laughs> uh, that you can see me acting all the time. <laughs> no, no, that, maybe maybe no. when you were younger, but I mean, there were no detractors of something like Richard Nixon. I mean, you were Richard Nixon. Well, that's uh, that's what's one of the joys of getting really old in acting is you really begin to just sit comfortably in your plate and mm -hmm. know that every time you go out on stage, you're you're the vessel of the writer. You're not there sh as as my late friend Annie Bancroft used to say, you're not there just showing your bloomers. <laughs> you're really, really just trying to be the vessel and trying to deliver the playwright's words to the audience, and you're then less self, less self-conscious. Yeah. When you said, uh, uh, as you've gotten older now, you're shedding the armor, mm -hmm. is that making you a better actor? Yes. I, he says modestly. <laughs> but, uh, I think it is, yeah. I think I'm more, um, much more available to my true feelings than I used to be. When you start out as a young actor, you want to go there because you're so unhappy with yourself in life that you want to become somebody else. So you go on stage and think, I know what I'll do. I'll become another person and there I'll be safe. And now you go out on stage and say, everything that is me 
that I can throw into the same mix with the character and mix it up is the real thrill of being an actor. I don't want to run away from myself to be an actor. I want to run towards myself. So you're discovering. That's why when I say that every performance is different, it's because every performance is a discovery in a way mm. of you. It's an art. It's a craft. You're not just getting up there. No, no, no. But it, it really is a chance to combine your artistry, if you will, with m as much of your own humanity as you can. Do you have any role models in this, in acting? I have a role model, but uh, it'll be a total surprise to you. All right. My role model is Ella Fitzgerald. Really? And she's my role model because I've never heard her sing a song, ever, that didn't sound as if she were singing it for the first time. Mm. And this is a great artist, and you can't, you can't put an Ella Fitzgerald record on from the time she started to the time she died where she doesn't take uh, a simple song like, well, just give me any stand. Just get a task. <laughs> well, that's not a stand. Well, it is a stand. <laughs> but she, pr she approaches every single song as if she's never sung it before, and she gives it every ounce of artistry, but it's also so human and so real. And if you put on other singers, many of whom are great, She's a one of a kind. Nobody comes near her. And so I always listen to Ella Fitzgerald in my dressing room, and I'm reminded, my God, she's probably sung this song 5,000 times. Yeah. And yet it sounds so fresh and new. And, and she always, always appears to be loving what she's doing. And I feel a tremendous obligation, no matter how I feel personally, mm -hmm. to make the audience feel I'm there for them every night. And doing it for them. The other night I saw somebody on television on one of these horrible, um, you know, talent shows. <laughs> the, the judges said you weren't very good and the person said, I felt great. And I thought, what well, doesn't matter what you feel. Yeah. <laughs> it only matters what the audience feels. Yeah. So when a young actor comes to me and says, I didn't feel good tonight, I will say, it depends upon what they took from it. Maybe your, maybe your discomfort read to them as something else. Mm -hmm. Never worry about what you feel. If you have a cold or you have a headache or even if you don't want to do it, never think about that. Just walk on stage and say there are a thousand people who have never seen it before. And whatever's going on inside me has, should mean nothing to them. They've paid money. They haven't paid it to see you muzzle around in your own pain. <laughs> Take it and make it art and yeah. give it to them. You know, we had um, Dame Edna on here once. Oh, yes. And she was complaining of uh, toothache. toothache. And she said, but you know, old Dr. Footlights always makes yeah. it go away. And she said, well, no matter how you're feeling, how sick you are, when you walk out on that stage, Dr. Footlights is there. Carol Channing calls it mother theater. <laughs> yeah. It heals. No it matter is. what it is, by the end of the night, you're feeling much better. Yeah. I wanted to ask you something about craft, as you were saying, because we don't see a lot of Terrence Radigan plays. We don't see another writer I love, Shaw, plays here. And I wonder, you are one of the few American actors who can do this kind of complex, complicated dialogue in these plays. Why is it that they're, you're a great actor, but why is it that so many young actors today just can't pull off this complicated language in these great English plays? It's not required of them. It's not that they, it's not that they can't do it. It's just not required. No teacher is teaching it in, in heavy doses. No casting agent wants it. No agent wants it. An agent will say to a young actor, come on, don't do this Radigan stuff. You've got to be free in order to get a job on L.A. Law, or whether I'm dating myself, whatever the current legal show is or the cop show is. So a young actor coming into the business has a very different world to face than I did. I came in 1960. So every night I went and saw George C. Scott, Colleen Dewhurst, Mildred Dunnick, uh, Joe Van Fleet, uh, you know, Jason Robards. All doing the, the great roles. Doing great roles in Inge, William Shaw, uh, Rolier. I saw actors doing it, and I wanted to do it. But nowadays, young actors don't see much of it, and when they do, they see it rather badly done, I'm afraid, I'm and afraid. rather stuffy. Yes, but kind of provincially. And yeah. provincially, or way too grandly. So they're not attracted to it, and no one in their circle, and actors now have circles of, of helpers. I didn't have anybody. I had one little old age, gay agent in the <laughs> village. And um, <laughs> now they have managers and uh, costume people, and they have so many people around them advising them wrong, really. You've got a book coming out. 
Yes, I do. Uh, can you tell us about it? It's called Dropped Names, and it's, <laughs> it's famous men and women as I knew them by Frank Langella. <laughs> so what famous <laughs> man and women? You knew every. I've talked to your. I've talked to people in the publishing business mm. who are are really buzzing about the book, and they say that. Uh, first of all, I got to say one top editor I know said that Frank Langell is a terrific writer. Mm. That the portraits of these people are so insightful and so vivid. Well, I'm glad because I started it um, a while back, about a year ago, when a very good friend of mine died, and I wasn't. I wasn't aware. I'd lost track of her in the last few years of her life, and um, I thought, God, there were so many things I wanted to say to her and say about her. And then I began to think that since the age of 15, I had met in the last 50 some odd years the most extraordinary people. That's what uh, being an actor can do for you. And that each and every one of them had, not every one of them, they're not all in the book, there are about 85 of them, but each and every one of them had brought something into my life and I'd learned something and had extraordinary relationships on all levels with so many fascinating people and they're all gone. And so I decided that I would uh, write a book about the people who've left, who live in my memory, mm. not people that you can you know, say, I saw this person the other day, but they're all here, they're all in my memory. And I had tried to write a book about my own career and got terribly bored and disinterested. <laughs> but whenever a magical person came into my life, when I was a teenager, it was people like Dolores Del Rio and Billy Burke and Marilyn Monroe. And, and then in the decades, as each decade came, the greats of that decade, I would find myself either at dinner with or at a party or working with or all sorts of other ways in which I related to them. They were so magical to me on so many levels, and I wanted to put down in a book form what the experience of having gone from 15 to 70 and met all these different people was like. Who was the person who died that got you thinking about this? Jill Clayburgh. Oh. So I sat down and wrote about Jill immediately that mm -hmm. afternoon. I was in Florida, and a young lady handed me this and said, who is that? And I said, who is that? And then. I realized there were so many things about her that were original and unique that public didn't know. So I wrote her, and then I wrote um, a, a day with John Kennedy and Jackie when I was 24, and then I wrote my experiences with Olivier on Dracula and uh, Robert Mitchum, Rita Hayworth, and that generation. And then as I got older, and uh, they got older and died, more came in, and I, I, I then I couldn't stop. So. And um, are your great friend Alan Bates, who you were yeah. so wonderful in Fortunes, for the, I'm sure book. he's got to be in that book. Yeah. Because you wrote a beautiful piece about him, I think, for the Equity Newsletter yeah, when he died. I did, and that sort of encouraged me. Yeah. And then I, I was very nervous to send it out, but I gave it to my agent, Lynn Nesbitt, mm -hmm. who's the sort of doyen of uh, literary agents, and she sent it to a lot of publishing houses, and they all bid, which was very flattering. Right. So it's, it comes out, Dropped Names comes out. Dropped Names comes out March the 20th. It's now, who, a long, who's your long publisher? Business. Harper Collins. Excellent. Yeah. Can you give us um, just one little tidbit, perhaps, about uh, Laurence Olivier? One of my <laughs> favorites about him, and, I, and he, uh, he's Larry, but that's not, I'm not being pretentious. It's <laughs> what he insisted that you call him, was that... Um, he once said to me over dinner, <laughs> after many, many dinners, and he said a million things, but the one, one of the things I love was that he said, you know, Frankie, one of the things you, I love most is ensemble acting. It's so <laughs> rewarding. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wanted to say, please, you know, one diva to another. <laughs> get, get out of my way, everybody. <laughs> you know? And it just was wonderful that he would be so disingenuous about it. So as if all of those, uh, you know, star vehicles meant nothing to him. <laughs> It's really, well. Right, well, you were last year, you told us you had a sign in your dressing room, and we were trying to remember what it said. It, I have five signs. All right. The one that's <laughs> most important is leap empty-handed into the void, and it's what every actor should know. Do your work, do your preparation, rehearse, know your lines, know what they mean, mean them when you say them, stand in the wings, and then just give yourself up to the universe and leap. And it's a wonderful feeling to come on with nothing in your head and to trust that you've done the preparation and adrenaline will now take over and you will find the most remarkable things if you do. 
And Frank, you're just terrific in Man and Boy. A wonderful bit of ensemble acting in this play. <laughs> <laughs> I, think. I dug such a hole with that story, didn't I? You yeah. see, I love that. At the American Airlines at the, uh, Theater. Frank Langella in Man and Boy, a very, very good Terrence Radigan play at the American Airlines Theater. And we do want you to come back when the book comes out. Drop name. Why? 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 Do you do books too? Of course. We, we do. Course. You know what we do? We do Frank Langella. Oh, so. well, thank you. <laughs> thanks, thanks a lot, well, Frank. It's a pleasure to be with you both. Great to see you. Thank you. It was all right when Vasily was a child. More than all right. I remember it very clearly. I suppose I felt that I could have let him love me then without any danger. What danger? A danger to me, to my way of life, to my universe. But to be loved and worshipped by a grown boy and this boy above all now, I will take any risk. You know that, Sven. But not the risk of being so close to the pure in heart. Our thanks to the Friends of Theatre Talk for their significant contribution to this production. Theatre Talk is made possible in part by the Frederick Lowe Foundation, the Eleanor Naylor Dana Charitable Trust, the Alan S. Gordon Foundation, the Corey and Bob Dinelli Charitable Fund, Carrie J. Fries, the Dorothy Strelson Foundation, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and the New York State Council on the Arts, a state agency. We welcome your questions or comments for Theater Talk. Thank you and good night.